Our next speaker this evening is one of my dear friends and neighbors. I call him Father Sam Clark because he wears the white collar and I was raised Catholic, so it's ingrained in my DNA. <laughs> Anyone with a white collar is father, but of course he'll laugh and call me Mother Lori. <laughs> but Father Sam Clark, Reverend Sam Clark, happens to be our program director with PJTN, and I'm honored to be able to introduce him and have him participate tonight. He comes um, with very distinguished credentials. Because Christian friends of Yad Vashem, I don't know if you're familiar, I know everyone here probably knows who Yad Vashem is, but they formed a Christian friends of Yad Vashem wing as a result of this movement of Christians who were supporting Israel around the globe. And they thought, you know what, we need to have this. Well, ironically, they tapped his shoulder to be the first executive director. So it's a tremendous honor to now have him. He served his time in, in Jerusalem, but it's a tremendous honor to have him affiliated with proclaiming justice to the nations. He's a great teacher on the history of anti-Semitism in Christianity, and we're so excited to have him here tonight. Please welcome Reverend Sam Clark. <laughs> I swear you. Well, it's, uh, thank you, Lori. Uh, thank you, Mark, and, and all you folks from El Shaddai. Uh, particularly, I want to thank Martin and Nona Brazier, who uh, are hosting me in their home. I thank all the people of El Shaddai. I'm a big fruit lover, and I walked into my room in their lovely home, and there was a big basket of fruit. And I said, well, somebody got a word of knowledge that I want some fruit, that I love fruit. Uh, so it's, it's a tremendous blessing. I met Mark at the NRB convention, as Lori mentioned, and what I discovered real quickly about him was he was a humble, humble man of God uh, with a tremendous ministry. Uh, there, as Lori said, there aren't many who do the kind of work that Mark does and, and what the kind of ministry that El Shaddai has. So it's a tremendous blessing to, to come from Nashville via Las Vegas here today to spend some time with you all. My relationship with Lori goes way, way back, uh, but one about, I don't know, it's been a couple of years now. I was on my front porch and I was praying we live on a, a little family farm. We have about 20 acres in Franklin, Tennessee. We're just south of Nashville. And I was praying, and, and I heard the Lord say, you need to get connected with Lori more. And I called Lori later that morning and, uh, because we were going to the, to the state house to, uh, uh, to watch them pass a resolution to support Israel that Lori was responsible for. And I said, well, Lori, do you, want, do you need a ride? And she said, no, no, I don't need a ride, but I want to ride back with you because I have something I want to talk to you about. So the very, within a few hours, we were talking. Now, we still haven't really figured out how, what this is going to look like. Uh, but we, this, I think this event is, is a critically important event, uh, not only for the church, uh, for El Shaddai, but for, for PJTN and taking a new direction on how can we expand our influence. The things that you all know, and I, I can assure you from just talking with Mark briefly last night, is you're probably gonna say, I've heard that before, I've heard that before, and you have. Probably not from an Anglican Episcopal minister before. Uh, <laughs> and probably won't happen again unless I come back here. Uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, if we'll go ahead and put the PowerPoint. I don't know if any of you know what this is. You do know what it is because you've heard the name before. This is actually something called a sabra. A sabra is a tenacious, thorny desert plant with a thick hide that conceals a sweet, softer interior. I've seen these up by the Galilee. Uh, they look like a cactus, and it's the fruit of a cactus. But it's a sabra. But it's, a sabra is just not a fruit. A sabra, as you all know, is a native-born Israeli. They are tenacious. They can be a bit thorny from time to time. They can be very thick skinned. They've had to be on the outside, but they're very sweet and tender, wonderful people on the inside. 
you know, when, when I worked at Yad Vashem, I worked with a cross section of Israelis from, from the very religious to the very secular. And I did not find what, well, first of all, I was treated with nothing but kindness and love the entire time I was there. But I also never found one single Israeli there that did not want peace in the land. They are willing to do more than I think they should be willing to do. They want peace so desperately. They are not warmongers. They do not hate the Palestinians and the Arabs. They're Arabs that work at Yad Vashem, who became dear friends of mine. So it's that the picture you see, as Mark alluded to in the media, and the reality are two different things. Now, you may not have seen this. This is the cactus with a family of Sabra. This is my Sabra family. Let me explain. My assistant at Yad Vashem, her name is Irit Berkovitz, is a ninth generation Jerusalemite on her father's side. That's 1700s, that goes way, way back. This is Irit, on, the far, on your far left is Barak, her son, who I was over at his wedding last June. Then next to him is his, his mother Irit, who I talk to every two or three weeks to this very day, because she's a dear friend. Next to her is Duty, David, Duty, her husband, and her beautiful daughter, Sharon. They are ninth and 10th generation. On the right, you'll see this is Shimon and Judith. They fought in every single war in, in Israel. They were there long before there was an Israel. Her mother, there's an article that you can read in the Jerusalem Post how her mother was killed in uh, the war of 1948. Well, fortunately, it was an erroneous article because she wasn't killed, went on to bear Erit and uh, her other uh, siblings. These are wonderful people, God. So why are Israelis tenacious and thorny on the outside, but sweet like this wonderful family, the Berkovitz family, on the inside? Well, I would suggest that life as Jews has taught them difficult lessons. Being a Jew has always been a challenging thing to be. For instance, the Shoah, the epitome of anti-Semitism. They refer to it more as the Shoah at Yavasham than the Holocaust, because the, holo the root word of the Holocaust is actually from a burnt offering. Shoah means the, the destruction. They refer to it as the Shoah. Shoah. Six million were murdered, including one and a half million and totally innocent children. What would this experience and the threat of it being repeated as it is today do to your disposition? When you are surrounded by people who have committed your destruction, would you maybe be a little thorny on the outside? They're incredibly sweet on the inside. During this Shoah, where were the church leaders? I came to my faith through a woman named Corey Ten Boom. Most of you probably have heard of Corey Ten Boom. She and her family saved over 750 Jews from Nazi terror in Holland during the war. She and her sister were both sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp because they were turned over by a Dutch informant. Her sister Betsy died at Ravensbrück, and Corey was actually scheduled to be terminated, but they filled out the wrong paperwork and she was released, thanks be to God. And then she spent the rest of her life going around the world sharing her story, her love for her Savior Jesus Christ, for Yeshua, and her love for the Jewish people. But the Cory Temzums were few and far between. Where were the people at the very top of the church, the church leaders? Where were they when the Nazis came to power? Hitler didn't start in the 30s talking about his anti-Semitism. He started in the 20s. He was utterly clear. He did not hide anything from people about the way he felt about the Jewish people. Where were, were the church leaders when they started putting these, these gold stars on the Jews to identify them, to denigrate them? Where were the church leaders? Where were they when this man made this claim? My feeling as a Christian leads me to be a fighter for my Lord and Savior. It leads me to the man who at one time, lonely and with only a few followers, 
recognized the Jews for what they were and called on men to fight against them. As a Christian, I owe something to my people. This man was not a Christian. He used Christianity to sell his message, to sell his scheme. Ultimately, he took over the church and established the Reich Church and had, instead of the Bible on the altar, had Mein Kampf. Instead of a cross, had the swastika. This man was no Christian at all, but he knew how. He was a politician, and he knew what he could do. But where were the church leaders when this man made this claim? What did the church hierarchy do? The United States Holocaust Museum Encyclopedia. Both the Catholic and Protestant churches did speak up on behalf of Jews who had converted to Christianity or for Jews married to members of their churches and thereby saved some lives. But neither the Catholic leadership nor the Protestant clerical hierarchy officially protested the persecution of Jews or the horrors of the final solution. The church leaders were silent. Even the confessing church was silent. The ones, the Lutheran church that stood strong for their church and their faith. There were exceptions. Dietrich Bonhoeffer stood firmly for the Jewish people. And we know what happened to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So the church was muted or silent. So the question is, if you were a Jew, would you believe that Christianity was complicit in the murder of six million of your people? Keep in mind that the Holocaust happened in Christian Germany and Christian Europe. That one of the main theologians to support Hitler was Martin Luther. And I know that tomorrow Mark will talk more about what Luther, the kind of things he said and did uh, towards the end of his life particularly. So if you're a Jew, what would you think about Christianity? What would your attitude be towards Christians and their religions? Now, keep in mind, Yad Vashem is one of the most holy institutions in all Israel. Israelis, you have, if you have two Israelis together, you get three opinions. There are not three opinions about Yad Vashem. This is a holy place. So the thought, as a matter of fact, when, when, uh, when Malcolm Heading, who's the head of the International Christian Embassy, called me and talked to me about this position, I was in Elot, which is down, it's the Florida of Israel, of Israel down by the, the Red Sea, the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. He said to me, Sam, are you sitting down? I said, well, no, Malcolm, but I can. He said, I want to tell you about something that's just happened. We have entered into a relationship, the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem and Yad Vashem to establish a Christian desk we would say office, at Yad Vashem, to build relationships between the Christian world and the Holocaust Museum. The reason he said that, the reason he asked me if I was sitting down is, that's inconceivable. Inconceivable. It had to be approved by the Prime Minister of Israel. The mayor of Jerusalem was opposed to it. When I got there and started the work, I couldn't tell anybody I was doing it because it was so controversial. You're a Holocaust survivor. They've started a Christian desk at Yad Vashem. How would that make you feel, given the history that's there? Very difficult, but what they did recognize is that there are people like Lori Cardoza Moore and Mark Biltz and the people of El Shaddai who have a different understanding of the relationship between Christians and Jews that genuinely love them will stand with them. They know the message. They know the gospel. They have to see the gospel in us. And we have to love them with the same kind of love that brought me, a drunk, into a personal relationship with God Almighty through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what they need to see from us. That's what we're called to do. The Holocaust, unfortunately, is only one example of 2,000 years of church hostility towards the Jewish people. It doesn't seem to make any sense. Why? When, when and, and why did the church begin to turn against their Hebrew heritage and the Jewish people? It doesn't make any sense when you actually look at the history. The answer is found in the roots of the church. 
in early Christian history. This isn't a modern thing that's happened where all of a sudden Christians became uh, anti-Semitic. It goes way back to virtually the very beginning, early part of the second century, late part of the first century. This was going on. Let's take a look at it. But let's first begin by answering this simple question. Let's take a look. How does God Almighty feel about his people? And I know that you all know all these verses, but it's helpful to remind ourselves and put these scriptures deep within our heart so then that those neighbors of yours who may not understand why you're so crazy about Israel and the Jewish people, you can say, well, this is what the word of God says. Exodus, Moses, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go. So I'm going to kill your firstborn son. That's a father talking about his firstborn son. Zechariah, whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. Jeremiah, I have loved you with a sometime love. A, 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 a love for a little while until you don't do what I tell you to do. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Isaiah, the great prophet. I love Isaiah. Favorite book in the Bible. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Trust me. When they were walking into those gas chambers at Auschwitz, when they were being murdered at Treblinka, that's what was going through their mind. Where's the Lord? Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she's born? Though she may forget, I will never forget you, Israel. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Does this sound like a God who's somehow done with his people? No way, no how. Ezekiel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will bring Jacob back from captivity and will have compassion on all the people of Israel. And I will be zealous for my holy name because I've placed my name on them. They will forget their shame and all the unfaithfulness they shore toward me when they lived in safety in their land with no one to make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the nations and gathered them from the countries of their enemies, I will show myself holy to them in the sight of many nations. As Lori said, May 14th, 1948, a prophecy from Isaiah was fulfilled. Is it possible that a nation can be born in a day? Not just in a day, but in a moment. At the strike of midnight, Israel was resurrected. The language was brought. The religion was brought. No nation on earth has ever been out of existence for the time frame that Israel and has come back with the same people and the same language. <laughs> to those who suggest there is no God, explain Israel. How is it possible for this people to exist? They were supposed to assimilate in all the world. They can't. God Almighty will never let them assimilate. That's not where they belong. They belong back in the land, and he's bringing them back there every single day. <laughs> Nothing in the Word of God suggests that God Almighty has forsaken or replaced his people with any other group of people, including the Gentile church. We are grafted into Israel not some separate institution. So why did the Holy One of Israel, Almighty God, choose these people as his own? Why? Why did he start with Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and go from there? Moses wrote, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples, for you the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you. God Almighty chose Israel because he agaped them. This isn't this warm, gushy kind of feeling that, you know, I get home to my beloved Mary Ann, my bride, and I look at her and I say, oh, you're so beautiful and I love you. You're such a doll. Uh, that's not what we're talking about here. This is, this is, I go home, say I'm Almighty God, and there's a woman there who's mad at me because I didn't do something. And, and, and he says, I love you. I don't care how you act. 
I choose to love you. This is called divine love. I love you even though you don't love me in return. The day's coming when you will because of this thing called the new covenant where I will put my law, my Torah in your hearts and, and a new spirit within you. God Almighty chose Israel because he loves you and me. He made a covenant with a man named Abraham and then with Isaac and Jacob. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Who could argue? that all of that wasn't fulfilled. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. That's one that the leaders of the world better take to heart. Because if they'll just look at history, they'll see every nation that has cursed Israel has suffered from doing so. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you, all of us, through uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, through Yeshua. Jesus, our Messiah, all the world has been blessed because God nailed the world's sins to that cross. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of Almighty God in him. So let's, let's look at the, where did the church begin? Where did we come from? Well, all of a sudden, did they have First Baptist Church in Bethlehem? Where did we come from? The first believers were Jewish. They were Messianic Jews, to put it in more contemporary terms. They were a sect within Judaism. They weren't something different. That's Judaism. You had Pharisees. The Pharisees are the only ones that really survived post-temple era. Then you had these, these, these Sadducees who didn't believe in the resurrection or life after death, and that's why you were, they were sad, you see, and I'm, I, I know you've heard that before. <laughs> Then you had this people said, well, the, 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 the Pharisees are corrupt. The Sadducees and their priesthood are corrupt. We are the Essenes. We're going down by the Dead Sea. We're going to live there, and we're going to write these scrolls down. We're going to stick them in a jar, and some shepherd a long time later is going to find the whole book of Isaiah written out, amongst other things. These people, trust me, I, I used to go down to the Dead Sea to bob around there uh, on the weekends. Uh, and, and to think of living there at 100 plus degrees all the time, I don't think so. Although Nashville this, this year has been like living in the Dead Sea. That's why I was so excited to come out here. I said, what's the temperature? 70. Woo, I like Seattle. <clears throat> Have you got an opening, Mark? Then you had, you got these, these people called the zealots. These are those people just causing trouble. They were zealous. <laughs> I, I think Lori has a little bit of zealot in her. Let me tell you, she is zealous. This woman, if, 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 you, if you're in her way, you don't want to be. But I want to tell you, because she's a friend, because I, I go to her home and, I, and her husband and family are dear friends of mine, this is one of the sweetest, kindest women you will ever meet in your life. That tough Lori, is, is, she's a sabra. She's a sabra, tough on the inside, but on the inside, she is a doll. And her husband, Stan, is a, just a great guy. Then they had this other little group called The Way. The Way was a Messianic Jewish sect within the Jewish community, not something different. I do feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Jesus and the Nazarenes, another name for them, the people of the Way, were not a separate religious group. Paul says, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they, Jews, call a sect. Even the Jews who were opposed to the Messianic Jews called them a sect. Didn't say they weren't Jews. They were a sect within Judaism, one that wasn't real popular at the time amongst some. Jesus was a Jew, an observant Jew. He lived according to God Almighty's divine plan for his chosen people, the Torah. The 12 apostles and all the first Nazarenes were observant Jews who believed Jesus was Messiah. They worshiped at the temple and the synagogues. Even though Paul has been taught, called the, the apostles to the Gentiles, read Acts. Where did he go in virtually every community he visited? The synagogue. Because there weren't just at the synagogue, there were Jews there, there were proselytes to Judaism, and then there was this group called God-fearers. 
Those who were Gentiles who hadn't converted, but they loved the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul ministered to those people along with the rest of the Jewish people. Jerusalem was the center of the faith. It didn't matter whether you were messianic or not messianic. The church was led by Jacob. There is no James in Hebrew. Jacob, <laughs> Jacob is Jacob. Some say, well, because it's the King James Bible, James wanted his name in there someplace. I don't know if that's true or not, but the book of Jacob, anyway. Jacob, this is Jacob, the brother of Jesus, was led, and the Jerusalem Council, as we know, met in Jerusalem. There is no evidence that they envisioned a new religion. They envisioned a fulfilled new covenant in and through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. The church was, if anything, could have been referred to as Elaine was talking about, the one new man church. Jesus himself is our peace. This is right after the verses that, that Lori read. Who has made the two, Jew and Gentile, one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with his commandments and regulations. Did he do away with the law and all the commandments and regulations? No. What he did was do away with the law that separated Jews and Gentiles. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making shalom, peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. We should have no hostility towards Messianic Jews or Jews who aren't yet Messianic. So how in the world do we go from a one new man church to the creation of a separate new religion that became hostile toward its Jewish heritage? It seems unfathomable. The answer is found in the expansion of the kingdom of Almighty God. You all remember on the day of Shavuot, 50 days after Jesus raised from the dead, uh, once again, Jews from all around the world gathered in Jerusalem for one of the three major feasts, Passover, Shavuot, and, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So they gather from all around the world. The disciples are there because Jesus says, don't leave, stay here until you receive the gift my Father promised, which was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. A transformation, an inner trans. The Spirit that will be upon you will now be in you. You will be different people. And Peter would demonstrate that immediately. Suddenly, there's a violent wind, tongues of fire. The promise has arrived. The disciples are filled with the Holy Ghost. They begin speaking in tongues through the power of the Spirit of God within them. Jews from around the world are astonished as the disciples declare the wonders of God in their own language. They had the gift of ears, I guess. What does this mean? What is just happening here? Peter, the same one who denied the Lord three times, with these same people gathered in Jerusalem. Now a spirit-filled Peter. He preaches the gospel to the crowds. 3,000 give their lives to Yeshua, the Messiah. 3,000 died down at Mount Sinai under the covenant, the old covenant, not the old covenant, but the, the, the Mosaic covenant. 3,000 now come to life through faith in Yeshua. 3,000 who would return to the ends of the world with the message of salvation through faith in Yeshua, the Jesus, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. The new covenant has arrived for the chosen people. But who were these 3,000 witnesses that came from around the world? Acts says they were staying in Jerusalem, devout Jews, both Jews and converts to Judaism from every nation under heaven. Two groups, devout Jews and converts to Judaism. So what about the Gentiles who are not converts to Judaism? Throughout the whole history of Israel, you could become part of the people of Israel, considered as a natural-born citizen simply by becoming a Jew, by going through snip-snip, a little procedure that's painful for men. You do that, and you could become a Jew in good standing. So what about the ones who weren't converts, who didn't? 
Paul refers to something called the mystery of the gospel that would transform everything and also open a Pandora's box to some challenges that Christians need to take to heart. This is the tale of two towns. In one town, Caesarea, there's two Caesareas in Israel, Caesarea Maritime, which is on the Mediterranean, and Caesarea Philippi, which is just north of Galilee. In Caesarea, there's a gentleman there whose name is Cornelius. In his family there, they are, uh, they, they, these are uh, these, these uh, God-fearers. They, weren't, they hadn't converted to Judaism, but they, they loved the God of Israel. And one day, about three o'clock, Cornelius has an angelic encounter. He says, the angel says, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at the angel in fear. This is a centurion. This is a leader of soldiers. Well, needless to say, you don't run into an angel every day. What is it, Lord? Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Send now to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who's called Peter. So, got to go south, down to Joppa. He sends men down there. The world is about to change. And meanwhile, down in Joppa, in the home of Simon the Tanner, and that's an actual picture. It says in English on the door, home of Simon the Tanner, there in Joppa. <laughs> Anything for tourism. <laughs> about noon the following day, Peter goes up on the roof to do his morning devotions. He has an, uh, a vision. A sheet falls from heaven containing unclean animals. Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Oy vey. No way. No, Lord. I'm not, I am kosher. I am not eating that stuff. Three times this happens. Do not call anything unclean that God has made clean. Now, Peter, I think in his mind, said, we're not talking about animals here. There's something else going on. Three men arrive at Simon's house. The angel says, three men are looking for you, Peter. Do not hesitate to go with them, okay? Why are you here? We have come from Cornelius the centurion, Gentile. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to Cornelius, Peter goes. This is not allowed in Torah. He's not allowed to go to Cornelius' house. Oh, he can stand outside, but he certainly can't go in. Well, things are changing. Peter arrives. You are well aware that it's against our Torah for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. May I ask you why you've sent for me? So he understood now the vision wasn't about pork. The vision was about men clean and unclean. Cornelius tells Peter the story of his angelic encounter. Peter, and I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Then things really got shook up. Peter preaches the gospel. The Holy Spirit came on all that heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. Revelation, the mystery of the gospel. Gentiles are included in the kingdom of God without converting to Judaism. Hallelujah. It's a gospel. But this is, this is great challenges. So the gospel spreads around the world. It's going everywhere now. And uh, in Acts, it says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Amidst the joy of the expanding kingdom, there is conflict, points of tension that the church, church is simply a Greek word, ecclesia. I'm sure Marcus taught you all about ecclesia. It means called out. It doesn't mean called out of Judaism. It means you're called out of the world into the kingdom of Almighty God. So amidst the joy, there is this potential conflict. First, certainly there's persecution. Jesus said, remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. There were Jews versus Messianic Jews. They were all, this is a family squabble that got very serious from time to time. Stephen was martyred. Jacob, the brother of John, Zebedee, was martyred. Peter and James were imprisoned. 
Paul had both the experience of being the persecutor and the persecuted. Paul persecutes the church. He says, Paul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, we know what happened. He's on his way to Damascus. And I'm always amused when people say, the Holy Spirit is always a gentleman. He will never force you to do anything. I wonder if Paul thought the Holy Spirit was a gentleman when he was knocked flat on the ground and blinded. (laughs) Sometimes the Lord will go to extremes to get our attention. Post-conversion Paul Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes, minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. The persecutor became the persecuted. Jews persecuted Messianic Jews. But how are believers called to to respond to anyone who may treat you uh, in a less than, quote, Christian way? Jesus was clear. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. That's how we are to respond to anybody. And the Jews are not excluded from anybody. We are, if we have a conflict or we have this division with our Jewish brothers and sisters, then we are the ones who are accountable. We are the ones who claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We are the ones who demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ, no matter whether they want to hear our message or not. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. They were called to follow the example and teaching of their Messiah. It says the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Their heart attitude was right. They knew when this happened to them, hallelujah, Jesus said this was going to happen. Now, how am I supposed to respond? Love your neighbor. And they saw, you know, it says, they will know that you're you're my disciples by the love you have one for another and by loving even your enemies. So there's internal tension, which had to be resolved with a council. The issue is Gentiles, the Torah, and salvation. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved, tying directly circumcision to salvation. The Pharisees took this position. Some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, not all of them, some of them, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the Torah of Moses. This is in order for salvation. We're blessed by the Torah. I know you have one, probably one of the great Torah teachers in the country. Embrace the Torah. It's good. It's Torah, as you all know from, from Mark, it's not law, bad boy, good girl. Torah is, this is the way. Walk in it. This is the way of life and peace and joy. This is how I designed you to be made. Well, the Jerusalem council had to make a decision. And they called, Peter stood up and said, I want to remind you, if something happened here about a a little over an hour away from here, if you're going by car, uh, it's Caesarea, that the Holy Spirit was poured out on these Gentiles who had not converted to Judaism. So James, Jacob, stood up and said, It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So you have two things there. One, this is salvation. They should abstain from these things. Some, some refer to that as Noah's, the Noah covenant. But also he says, you know, the, n- n- these Gentiles who come into the kingdom are going to hear the Torah. They're going to learn what it's, what, how, what God's plan is. Okay. 
This was the official position, but not everyone was totally convinced. Like I said, two Jews, three opinions. <laughs> Jacob and the council had their opinion. Well, some messianic, messianic believers couldn't go there. Hence, later Paul had to write a little letter to the, to the Galatians to remind them uh, to uh, treat Torah the way it's supposed to be treated and don't you misuse it. It's not an issue of salvation. It is an issue of the result of salvation. So, so we have these major stress points. We got Roman tension with the Jews, thanks to the Zealots. You have Roman persecution of Christians. Don't, some don't think about that, but Nero was from 64 to 68, and he was not very nice. Jews persecuting Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews in ten tension with believing Gentiles. Some Messianic Jews in tension with believing Gentiles over the role of Torah for Gentile believers. That tension exists to this very day. It's a tough issue. In the midst of this, we have a disaster that's going to change everything looming. A crisis, a catalyst that could tear this Jewish sect away from its Hebrew heritage. Tishbaev, the ninth day of Av, 70 AD, day of infamy, crisis. The zealots initiate a revolt against Roman rule in Israel. The Romans have had it. Emperor Vespasian sends his son Titus, who's a Roman general in the Middle East, to viciously put down the revolt, killing over one million Jews. The ninth day of Av is the destruction of the temple, the center of Jewish faith and the sacrificial system. Profoundly traumatic experience for the Jews. What are they going to do? How do they achieve atonement without a temple? How do you explain the disastrous outcome of this rebellion? How to live in a post-temple Roman Greek world? How to connect the present traditions with those from the past. Well, there was a development that came out of this of a new Judaism, a Judaism that actually has its roots in Babylon. For when they were taken into Babylon, they had the same problems, no temple. So they had to, to develop a new way of, of, uh, in, of the walking with Almighty God. So they developed the school of rabbinic Judaism in Yavna, another place also known as, as Jam, Jamnia. It began with the Babylonian, I just already said that. Okay, mission. Develop answers to the question born out of the destruction of the temple. What are we going to do? How do we atone for sin? So they develop an, uh, 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 the development of an independence of Messianic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism and Messianic Judaism are not one and the same. So it's going to create a tension between the two. As a matter of fact, the, uh, between 66 and 68 D, the Jewish community fled to Pella instead of Jamnia, which is over in Pella's in Jordan. They fled there and began to establish their Messianic community. They refused to support the rebellion against Rome. Now, you can imagine, you're a Jew, and there's another Jew who's a member of a sect within Judaism, and they're not going to stand with their brothers against Rome. They were branded as disloyal, as treason. Pella became the temporary center of Judeo-Christianity. Judeo they had to develop answers to the question born out of the destruction of the temple, which were far easier because our faith and our understanding of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ covers some of the problems that in, Messi in, in rabbinic Judaism they had to wrestle with. Ninth day of Av, 70 AD, rabbinic Judaism came into being, and over the centuries, things would, would descend from that. You have the ultra-Orthodox, the Orthodox, the conservative today, the Reformed, etc., cetera, et cetera. In Christianity, you had some tension between the Messianic and Gentile branches of Christianity. But out of that comes Messianic Judaism. Uh, Messianic Judaism actually almost disappeared by the 7th century, 8th, 7th, and 8th century. Matter of fact, 
there's not much history that you can find on Messianic Judaism until a resurrection of Messianic Judaism during the 19th century. Fascinating, it came at the same time the Jews began to talk about going back to the land. Rise in Messianic Judaism, go back to the land. Do we think that's a coincidence? I don't think so. Then you have Roman Catholics, you have the Orthodox, the Protestant, etc. Then you have the tension, the conflict between Jews and the church, which essentially become a separate thing. The issue is new covenant or new religion. Where do we go at this point? The destruction of the temple from a Nazarene, from, a, from the people of the way perspective. Jesus predicted the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and the temple. No surprise. When the Roman army began marching towards Jerusalem, they turned on Fox News and they, they said, we're getting out of here because <laughs> Jesus said this was going to happen. Branded as traitors. Ron Mosley, who's, who's a, 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 a wonderful man of God, wrote, after the temple was destroyed in AD 70, two new religious, religious organizations grew out of the Judaism of Jesus and Paul's day. The Pharisees fled to Jerusalem to Yavna and were spared, while the Jewish followers of Jesus fled to the mountains of Pella and also survived. From these two groups came two separate religions known as Rabbinic Judaism and the Christian Church. From sect to separation, a new era is on the verge. How are these, this Christian church going to look towards its Hebrew heritage? How will they look at the Hebrew scriptures in the light of their Jewish Messiah? The Gentile church began to grow. Gentiles returned to the Lord in large numbers around the world. Less Jews were because those Messianics refused to stand with us against Rome. Less Jews came in, more Gentiles. There were a majority by the second century. There was a rise of Gentile church leadership. The center of Christianity moved to Antioch, then to Northern Africa and Alexandria, and finally to Rome. Tensions begin to mount. Should we worship on Shabbat or on the, the day of the Lord, the Lord's day, Sunday? This change that happened early in the second century, which radically transformed the relationship between Jews who believed that Jesus was Messiah and Jews who didn't, between Gentiles who now had control of a Gentile church and their Hebrew heritage. Bishop Ignatius of Antioch in 115, no longer live for the Sabbath, but for the Lord's day on which day our life arose. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Hebrews says there remains a Shabbat for the people of God. The rest that we have that Jesus fulfilled is a rest. We rest in him, in his righteousness, in his holiness. We are people of God through faith in Yeshua. Why would we do away with the day that, that we should hold up as every week that says, this reminds me of the rest that I have in my Messiah? The only explanation is that Bishop Ignatius wanted to distance himself from his Hebrew heritage. The Didache, which was a manual for church instruction written around 120 AD, directs Christians to come together on the Lord's Day to worship. The problem is the Jewish community interpreted the church's decision to, to, to worship on Sunday as a rejection of the very heart of the Jewish experience, rejection of the Torah. That's from our father Abraham, Marvin Wilson. If you've not read that book, you need to read that book. It is a wonderful book to help you better understand some of these issues. Note, the change from Shabbat to Sunday didn't actually become official until 364 A.D. at the Council of Laodicea, but it was already in the mill long before that. There was also on the other side, the Jewish community came up with something called the Berkat HaMinim. Uh, this uh, somewhere around 85 to 115 A.D. This is a, a benediction, which is not really a benediction. We usually think of benedictions as blessings. Well, this was a, a curse. 
And it's a part of their daily prayers. For apostates, let there be no hope, and the dominion of arrogance do thou speedily root out in our days. And let the Nazarim, Nazarim was another name for, for those who believed Jesus was Messiah, and the Menim, heretics, perish in a moment. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and let them not be written with the righteous. Now, needless to say, I think that Dale Carnegie would say that's probably not the best way to win friends and influence people. Actually, fairly contemporary history has, has some strong evidence that Nazarene was not added until between 150 and 400 in A.D. So it would have just been against heretics. Now, Jews, Messianic Jews were still part of the synagogue when this was going on. So it was created some, some problems. Up to the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Burkhat Hamanim was divisive, but Messianic Jews were still part of the synagogue. The final blow was this Bar Kokhba revolt. In 134, there's a Jewish revolt against the Romans led by Simon Bar Kokhba. Uh, Rabbi Akiba, one of the great rabbis in the history of Israel, declared that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. This is a problem. Nazarenes, Yeshua is the Messiah, and there is no other Messiah. Messianic Jews refused to join the rebellion, and again, they are traitors. Over 500,000 Jews perished during this rebellion. Jerusalem was leveled. In 135 AD, Jerusalem was rebuilt as a Roman city, Aila Capitolina, renamed and Jews kicked out. Jews are barred from the city. Jerusalem is no longer the center of Judaism or the center of Christianity. The church and synagogue are torn apart. Two religions who are now in the beginning stages of conflict. Will believers, will you and I, today, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you? And I would say, the Jews aren't your enemies. They're not trying to curse you. They want to be loved. And, this, and they are surrounded by people who, quite frankly, do not love them. But you and I can express that love from north, south, east, and west. As God Almighty brings his people back to the land, all around the globe, Christians can stand up with Lori Moore and, and other leaders to stand with Israel. The genesis of the disaster is two deadly theologies, of which Mark is going to really get into more tomorrow. One is that God Almighty has forsaken the Jews. Proof the temple was destroyed and the Jews are moved from Jerusalem. Secondly, the church is the new Israel. This is replacement theology, which I know he'll, he'll deal with. The church should be in the new Israel, has replaced the people of God as the chosen people. The church is the new or true Israel that has permanently replaced or superseded Israel as the people of God. Now, I want to, you know, most churches don't come out and proclaim uh, replacement theology. They don't say the church is replacing. But when you, when, you, when you have a minister, a preacher, a priest, a father, stand up and reading through the scriptures and comes to uh, Israel and is some a blessing and infers that that's the church and when it's a curse, say it's the Jews, that may not be overt replacement theology, but it's the same thing. And if you grow, you grow up that in the church, you're going to you subtly, you're going to buy into it without ever knowing that you have bought into something so erroneous. The church has replaced Israel in God's plan. There is no future for Israel. May 14th, 1948 has shaken the church at its very core. That wasn't supposed to happen. So let's look at some uh, of church history ba based on this fatal foundation. God Almighty has forsaken the Jewish people. He's replaced Israel with the church. The Jews deserve to suffer what they did to their Messiah. Abandoned Jewish religious practices. My problem with abandoning Jewish practices, and some are, would be Jewish practices that we don't necessarily need to follow. But when you read, read Leviticus chapter 23, and you read about all the feasts, and Jesus said, those things were a shadow of me, 
Why in the world would you replace those things with other things? I have no issue with Christmas. I have no issue with Easter. They, they are different terms for tremendous events. But why in the world would you throw out all the richness that you can glean from looking at these biblical feasts, especially in the light of Messiah Jesus? It's ridiculous to do that. You cut off your nose to despite your face. Anti-Judaism and the early church fathers. Anti-Judaism is necessarily going to meet, lead to anti-Semitism. If you're against somebody's religion, it won't be long before you're against them. Today's new anti-Semitism is rooted in anti-Zionism. But if you're against the people's right to their land, eventually, if they don't leave, you'll be against them. Hence, contemporary anti-Semitism. Bishop Ignatius, the epistle to the Magnesians. For if we are still practicing Judaism, we admit that we have not received God's favor. It is wrong to talk about Jesus Christ and live like Jews. For Christianity did not believe in Judaism, but Judaism in Christianity. That's pretty lightweight compared to some. The epistle of Barnabas. Take heed to yourselves and be not like some piling up your sins and saying that the covenant is theirs as well as ours. It's ours. They have lost it completely. That, that is so, demonstrates such ignorance of the beginning of the church. Without the messianic community, we wouldn't exist. They're the ones that got the whole thing moving. Justin Martyr, in his dialogue with Trofa, we too would observe your circumcision of the flesh, your Sabbath days, and in a word, all your festivals. If we were not aware of the reason why they were imposed upon you because of your sins and the hardness of your heart. Okay, Shabbat, Passover, Shavuot, Sukkot, and all the other days associated with those three major feasts are imposed. This is by someone who supposedly reads the letters to, uh, that Paul wrote, where he talks about that, that word in the Gospels, where it talks about Jesus saying, he didn't come to do away with the Torah, he came to fulfill it. And that all these feasts were about him. Yet because they were associated with the Jewish people, they want to throw them out. Origen, this guy has created more problems from the church than just about anyone else. He's the one, he, he, because of him, the, the, the scriptures are spiritualized. He was the one who really came up with, you don't just look at the scriptures, but everything in there has to be spiritualized. It has meanings behind meanings. Well, some of that's true, but you take it too far, as he would, you've got problems. We may thus assert in utter confidence that the Jews will not return to their earlier situation, for they have committed the most abominable of crimes in forming this conspiracy against the Savior of the human race. Hence, the city where Jesus suffered was necessarily destroyed. The Jewish nation was driven from its country, and another people was called by God to the blessed election. This is probably one of the greatest preachers in the history of the church, supposedly, John Chrysostom. His name means golden-mouthed preacher. This will turn your blood. The synagogue is worse than a brothel. It is a den of scoundrels and the repair of wild beasts, a temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults, the refuse of brigands and debauchees, the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ. Didn't Paul write, we are to provoke to jealousy? I think he's provoking, but he certainly isn't making anybody jealous. He's making them mad. A den of thieves, a house of ill fame, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf, an abyss of perdition. I would say the same things about their souls. For as for me, I hate the synagogue and I hate the Jews for the same reason. Unbelievable. This is a man held in high esteem in church history. Council of Nicaea, 325, and I'm going to close with this. Easter. It's, it would be convenient that we all keep the feast on one day because, you know, that Passover thing moves around every year. 
For what would be more beautiful and more desirable than to see this festival through which we receive the hope of immortality celebrated by with, when, with all in one accord and in the same manner? It was declared to be particularly unworthy for this, the holiest of all festivals, to follow the custom of the Jews who had soiled their hands with the most fearful of crimes and whose minds were blinded. In other words, Easter should supersede Passover because of those Jews. Jesus was crucified on Passover. He celebrated. When, when they celebrate Holy Communion, I think some of them forget that that is a Passover meal. And you want to separate from Passover? No, what they want to do was separate from anything Jewish because they want to provoke, denigrate, and ultimately murder the Jewish people. Council of Nicaea. We ought not, to, therefore, to have anything in common with the Jews. We desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews. For it is truly shameful of us to hear them boast that without their direction we would not keep this feast. How can they be right? They who, after the death of the, of the Savior, have no longer been led by reason but wild violence, as their delusion may urge them. They do not possess the truth in this Easter question. We could not imitate those who are openly in error. But even if this were not so, it would be your duty not to tarnish your soul by communications with such wicked people, the Jews. Now, I've often thought, if Peter and Paul were here and we said something about uh, are you going to celebrate uh, Christmas this year? Where are you going to celebrate? Are you going to go see your family on Christmas? What are you going to do for Easter and Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Monday, Thursday? <laughs> Peter and Paul would look at him like, say what? <laughs> what are you talking about? These are our heritage. The things that we celebrate on, on our, on, on the Gentile Christian holiday are all directly connected with our heritage. Why not just unfold instead of replace? Reveal instead of conceal. <laughs> our Savior has left us only one festival day of our redemption, that is to say of His holy passion. And He desired to establish only one Catholic, which means universal, church. For this reason, divine providence wills that this custom, Passover, should be rectified and regulated in a uniform way. They're basically saying we're going to change the date. And everyone, I hope, will agree up to this point. It is our duty not to have anything in common with the murderers of our Lord. You know, when, when Pontius Pilate, when, no, when, when, when Caiaphas offered up Jesus as a sacrifice. He did it as a high priest. He even prophesied, it's better that one man die than a, than a nation be destroyed. Now, he didn't willingly do this as a high priest, but he was fulfilling the function of a high priest by offering the most perfect lamb who was ever offered in the history of the world, the lamb of God, the son of almighty God for the sins of the world. And yet, we want to change it. We want to, want to look back there and appreciate what God Almighty, last time I looked, it wasn't uh, the assassin, the Jewish assassins. It was my sins that killed my Messiah. He died. And a matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 53, one of the, my favorite chapter in the Bible, it said it was the Father who offered him up. Jesus said, I could call on a legion of angels, put your swords away. He willingly offered himself because of his love. Any Judaism leads to any Semitism in the same way as today's anti Zion will do the same, has done the same. Anti Semitism in Europe is about the same level as it was in the 1930s. It's back. The bottom line any Semitism that silenced the church hierarchy during Hitler's reign of terror has its roots in anti-Judaism that began in the early church and continues to this very day. Tomorrow, Pastor Mark will, will begin unfolding more about this story, particularly from Nicaea on. It's important that you and I understand this story so that we can communicate. No, we just don't love Israel because, you know, we love Israel. We love Israel because God Almighty loves Israel. We love Israel because we're called to. 
And, and the prophet said, the Gentiles will bring them back to the land, and Gentiles are doing that. It has been such a blessing, and I can't wait for the I can't wait to hear Mark tomorrow. Uh, this is a brother I just barely know, and I, I'm sitting on, I can't wait till I, I can put my father thing away, come here in plain clothes, and sit here and enjoy the teaching of this man of God and be with you wonderful people. And I get to go home with Martin and Nona tonight, sleep in their wonderful home, and eat some of that great fruit that El Shaddai has provided for me. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I thank Lori. And I ask that Yeshua will bless you. And I want to call on Elaine to come back and, and lead us in prayer again. Thank you for standing. Let's bring our hearts before the Lord. Considering all these things, let's come before him in a closing prayer. Because of the history, because of the current situations, and because of our destiny, oh Lord God, may we go. May we go forth into Jerusalem and into Judea and into Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And may we preach the word and may we live the word and may we demonstrate the word by the power of the spirit in signs and wonders and mighty miracles. May we heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse the lepers Cast out demons, for the kingdom of our God has come, and it is advancing, and powerful men and powerful women are pressing into it. Let no one despise you because of your age or because of any apparent lack, for in God you lack nothing. The I am is with you. So go and live in the world and in front of the world for the world to see and for the world to know and for the world to believe. For the world to see me, says God, when they see you. For the world to hear me when they hear you. For the world to touch me when they touch you. So touch their lives and fill their souls and enter their hearts with the love of God and the light of God, and the truth of God that sets all men free. For Christ has come, and their sins are forgiven. So come home to me and be redeemed and set free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So get mistaken for Jesus. Get mistaken for Jesus. Be free and be whole and be holy. Reach out a hand before you point a finger. Touch a life. Stand in the gap, show them great mercy and great love because I love them, love them for me, loving them as I love them, love them for me, and we will set the world free. So go forth, beloved, and never look back. Amen and amen. Thank you, Elaine. That wraps up this evening. So tomorrow morning, we'll meet you back here at 10 o'clock, ready for the rest. And then again, as Pastor Art said, we will break from 1230 until 7 p.m. tomorrow night. We'll be back here for the closing of the conference. So God bless you all. And thank you again for coming this evening. Thank you.